Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on tips on teaching immunology. My name is Adam Kessner. I am the Life Sciences Marketing Manager at Cengage. So next, I'd like to turn it over to Kyla from HAPS to say a few words. Thanks, Adam. Hi, folks. I'm Kyla Ross. I'm the past president for HAPS, and I'm excited uh, to be here. And uh, on behalf of HAPS, uh, today's webinar marks the third and final in our series uh, of the HAPS Cengage webinar uh, series on and today's topic tips on teaching immunology we're very excited Cengage has been a, a great and excellent partner with HAPS and we're excited to be here. Uh, I did want to just make a couple of announcements on behalf of HAPS uh, just for the folks in the audience here. Uh, the first is that we're really excited to launch officially our executive director search. So that is live. Uh, announcements are going out and are now posted on our website. We are really looking for um, folks to apply. And so you can read a little bit more about that on our website uh, and direct any questions if you have those uh, and spread the word. We have a couple of uh, events. So tomorrow we have a HAPS uh, Educator Town Hall, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about HAPS Educator article submissions and review processes, please join us for that. We have two upcoming regional conferences, uh, the 21st and 22nd in Bloomington, Minnesota, the 29th in Farmington, New Mexico, and then a regional director's uh, chat on uh, 11 on November 7th. So you can come and meet our regional directors and talk about job applications and searches there. So uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to Adam for the rest of our introduction and today's webinar. Thank you very much, Kyla. And uh, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Lisko. Thank you, Adam. And hi, everybody. It's really nice to see you all again. <clears throat> Um, I am uh, Liz Poe, and um, today we're going to talk a little bit about immunology. Um, I've been teaching a and for 13 years, uh, and before that I studied immunology. So it's like my past life a little bit, and when I get to um, talk about immunology in my teaching, it brings me a tremendous amount of excitement, and that's the thing I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, so <clears throat> I... Um, have just one slide on kind of the what I see as the benefits of teaching immunology. Um, I know uh, that, uh, you know, kind of the number one pain point that we all experience is that there is just so much to cover. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to, to um, kind of show you guys a really streamlined way to do it so that it wouldn't even take up like a whole lecture session, um, but to be able to kind of touch on some of the things that I think are really valuable for our students to walk away from walk away with. Uh, and I'll show you two approaches. So there's one in which we can kind of do a fundamentals approach um, and then a different one where uh, we take something that the students are interested in um, and kind of go from there. So um, in terms of why not just skip immunology, what are the benefits? It's funny, this is a list that I wrote prior to the pandemic. Um, and so when I looked it up and, and kind of dusted it off for this talk, I, um, found that I still agreed with everything I had written before uh, and that everything felt just as true, but somehow now post pandemic, a little bit more urgent. Uh, and that's something that we'll talk about a little bit today in that the, the kind of uh, global conversation has prepared our students to talk about immunology in a really different way, uh, which is interesting to think about as an educator. So I think first and foremost, you know, our students are um, mainly interested in becoming healthcare professionals. And so you know, one of the things that we can kind of think about post pandemic or, or in this phase of the pandemic um, is the fact that even like dental hygienists or physical therapists now had to think about infectious disease in a different way. Um, and so I, I think that it's really important to kind of set that groundwork for these conversations for students and orient them in kind of a, a scientifically accurate or medically accurate um, way. Of course, all of our students eventually or even currently will be faced with decisions about their own health and acting as advocates for themselves. There's actually a lot of studies coming out that um, some of the, the best predictors of outcomes uh, in clinical settings are how strongly a, a patient is able to advocate for their own needs. Uh, and so, you know, I think about myself and my students a lot that I'm giving them the tools to have those conversations. Uh, and of course, a lot of our students won't just be advocating for their own health, but will be advocating for the health of others, parents or children or um, you know, other, uh, other loved ones. <clears throat> 
Uh, if our students do reproduce, right, they have to make a lot of decisions that have to do with infectious disease, everything from kind of preschools um, and hygiene to whether or not to vaccinate. Uh, so being able to give um, students, again, that kind of scientifically accurate perspective on some of these topics um, can empower them in that decision making process as well. Some of our students may be involved in research and so having a fundamental understanding of, um, of these topics is helpful. And then the last one, and again, all of these things feel a little bit more urgent um, after three years of a pandemic. Um, all of our students hopefully uh, vote. Some of them may even run for public office. And now we understand um, what kind of a role our um, our legislation uh, has in public health outcomes. Uh, and so for all of these reasons, um, I think that it is useful to kind of be able to frame these topics out a little bit in our courses, uh, if we can carve out just a little bit of time. <clears throat> and again, I kind of framed this with the idea of maybe like a 30 minute or 60 minute opportunity to talk to the students. Um, and I'll show you some extension points that if you if you did have more time, you could, you could hit on. So, two topics. One is to take that kind of fundamentals approach. So if I'm going for a strictly kind of fundamentals, nuts and bolts here is the immune system. I usually kind of tie it in the place where we are talking about the cardiovascular system, lymphatics, and then I kind of add in a little bit of the immune system. So we're going to go through that together first. Um, and then the hot topics approach is one that I've used before in my um, classes. So a lot of student, times I'll let my students pick something they're interested in. And then I just think, well, what is it that I need to teach them in order for us to be able to digest this um, you know, topic of conversation? So this is a, an article that actually I was sitting with some of my friends um, and we were talking about uh, side effects after COVID vaccines and somebody you know, did a quick search, pulled up an article on their phone and started looking at this New York Times article. And it made me think, well, our students are really digesting so much information about immunology these days. Um, so we could almost allow them you know, a choice of topics or articles or allow them to bring something in and then just ask ourselves as educators, what do we need to prepare them for in order for us to have a classroom discussion around this um, topic or article? So we're going to use this article because it was fresh in my mind, um, but I'll show you some other opportunities to, to kind of do that. <clears throat> so in terms of fundamentals, I usually would put the immune system right alongside lymphatics. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of just talked about the cardiovascular system. We've talked about Starling's forces. And we've um, kind of elaborated for the students the idea that that our blood plasma right gets forced to become a uh, forced out of the blood system to become interstitial fluid and then it is collected within the lymph and this is part of this kind of fluid regulation system within the body and so i probably would even go into the structure of lymphatic vessels a little bit um, to illustrate that, that we have this interstitial fluid that's really bathing all of the cells of the body. And as the fluid pressure builds up, then it is, enters into uh, the lymphatics and becomes what we call lymph. And so that allows us that little bit of structure function, um, but doesn't require really a terrible amount of prep, right? And that lymph, which is a kind of a continuation of the fluid that was interstitial fluid, a continuation of the fluid that was blood plasma, is now going to be added back to the cardiovascular system um, in order to maintain pressure. But what we're really looking at is fluid that is, again, kind of passed over or bathed all the cells of the body. So this is a tremendous opportunity for surveillance. And so what we can do is before we put it back in the blood system and allow it to go everywhere throughout the body, we can just take a peek. And what we're really looking at is the external environment of every cell in the body, right? Because it's all been kind of exposed to this um, interstitial fluid. And so then I'll say, well, how would we survey this, this fluid? What we do is we kind of run it through an immune system filter. So we call these lymph nodes. Typically, if you mention a lymph node in class and the students automatically reach for their cervical lymph nodes, they are familiar with these structures from their own kind of life as, as having been sick at one or two times in their lives. Um, and so we already have this kind of perspective that like, okay, when I'm sick, my lymph nodes are active. What's going on in them? And so I'll go through a little bit of the idea of like the afferent vessels are bringing lymph towards the, the lymph node, it's filtering through, uh, and then these um, efferent vessels are leaving. And so what happens is the fluid's in there? That's kind of our, our main question in terms of the immune system. 
Uh, and so I'm going to tell, I would tell my students, I, I brief them, right, that I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of steps and you won't know all of these cell types, but we're going to go through them afterwards. So I'd say that pathogens or debris from an infection somewhere in the, in the tissues will arrive at the lymph node and a certain type of cell called phagocytes becomes activated. These phagocytes will activate another cell type called helper T cells. Helper T cells will help to drive the activation and differentiation of another cell type, B cells, and that results in antibodies. So at this point, students have like this kind of full story and then we can go in and dial in the details. And so I'll say, you know, these are all of the cells of the immune system, but only these ones are found in lymph nodes. So we can actually talk about what each of them does in this sort of response. So this is our list that we had. The first thing that happens is pathogens or debris from infection arrives and they might arrive in an activated phagocyte or activate phagocytes when uh, it arrives at the lymph node. So what are phagocytes? These are cells that are capable of engulfing either material like debris or even whole pathogens. And so they really are this kind of um, connection point between a pathogen or an infection and activating the immune system. So the two types that we would find here in a lymph node are called dendritic cells or macrophages. <clears throat> and then there, these phagocytes, they've engulfed and recognized that there's something here that has to do with infection. And so they activate helper T cells. So helper T cells are, I like to think of them as kind of like the squad leaders or cheerleaders of the immune system, right? They are shouting out instructions and really guiding what happens with the immune response after this point. Uh, and that's why we call them helpers, because they're really kind of helping to facilitate all of the, the next set of responders. <clears throat> and so one of the things that they are going to do next if they're activated within a lymph node is to drive the differentiation of B cells. So we can see the B cells over here on our, um, on our list, and they go from kind of being inactivated to suddenly being able to produce antibodies. B cells can do other things, but we're gonna kind of focus on this antibody response. <clears throat> so antibodies and T cell responses are this kind of main thing that can happen in an immune response, especially in the lymph node. And so one of the things that these two, um, Actually, let's talk about antibodies for a second before we get to that. So antibodies are proteins that can bind pathogens and help in their elimination from the body. They actually can do a lot of things, but I like to think of them as kind of facilitating the exit or the elimination uh, of the pathogen. And so um, between um, antibodies and T cell responses, we can begin to turn this infection around, right? We can begin to eliminate the infection, eliminate the pathogen and restore health. But the other thing that happens is that both the B cells that are producing antibodies and these T cells can become a part of a memory response. And so if you look at the graph that's on the lower right of the screen, you can see that it takes a little bit of time for this initial like exposure to a pathogen to result in a bunch of antibodies to be made. This is the time that it takes for those steps that we just talked about to happen. Phagocytes become activated, helper T cells become activated, and then our B cells begin to, to um, produce a lot of antibodies. So this all takes a little bit of time, but once we have those B cells and they know they can make a great antibody that's useful, then they stick around as memory cells and they're able to respond almost immediately if that pathogen ever comes back to our body. And so we call this a memory response and it means that second and subsequent exposures, usually we can eliminate the pathogen very quickly. You may not even produce very many symptoms. So you might encounter a pathogen you've already seen and you wouldn't even know it because you didn't feel sick. Your immune system was already primed uh, to be able to eliminate that uh, infection. <clears throat> Surveillance can occur in other locations as well. So we talked about lymph nodes, but there's also um, the lymphoid tissue that's in the gut wall. So we call this mucosa associated lymphoid tissue or malt. You can see these little green patches of it throughout our gut. Um, and so this is a really important place of surveillance, right? Because you take in all kinds of things through your mouth. Um, and so the um, surveillance within the gut allows for um, us to be able to kind of, well, survey. Uh, what's there and, and if there's anything that needs to be responded to. 
we also have these surveillance points within our pharynx. So the um, tonsils and adenoids um, are kind of providing that opportunity for surveillance for the things that we breathe and eat and drink. <clears throat> and then we have a lot of kind of um, much more um, uh, individual, like one cell at a time, um, surveillance that happens in our skin. And then that makes a lot of sense because our skin is one of our kind of contact points uh, with the outside world. So in your class, you could kind of end it there, right? It gives this kind of very brief overview, but you've kind of prepped the stage for um, you know, a naive or a first response versus a memory response kind of what happens in the lymph node, the idea of surveillance of the immune system. If you had time, you could extend it to kind of talk about what responses look like when something is found, when there's a pathogen. I love this conversation with our students because um, one of the things that, that we get to is that a lot of what we consider a symptom, like a fever, for example, or fatigue or aches, they're actually all evidence of our immune system responding. And so I even tell them that like, oh, when I'm feeling really terrible, if I'm sick, like I take this moment to thank my immune system for all of its work. Like, oh, I'm so achy. Thank you for all of your work, bone marrow. Um, so I, I like to have that conversation with students because it gives them a little bit of perspective about what being sick is about and the work that happens in your immune system and the tremendous amount of energy that it takes. So I would say that Typically, if you kind of stopped at surveillance, that would be like probably 20 to 30 minutes of class time, depending on the prep of your, you know, how much your students understood. And if you wanted to go into this, I would say it would take a full hour. Um, but again, that's, that's one, you know, typically one class period, depending on, on the situation at your individual school. So it's one way to kind of um, present the immune system in a pretty concise and simple format. I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions or discussion points that you guys want to uh, plunk into the chat. There are no questions, but uh, there was a comment that just came in. They tell them that the reason so many diseases cause flu-like symptoms is that the immune system is what actually causes flu-like symptoms. Yes, our immune system has a limited set of tools, right? We've got fever, we've got aches, we've got fatigue, we've got snot, we've got coughing, right? And so these things come about a lot of the time because that's what our immune system is doing regardless of what the pathogen is. I love that. That's awesome. There's nothing else plunked into the chat, then I will go on to the second perspective. And again, this one takes a little bit more prep on our part, right? Like it's a little bit easier to package the story and you know send it out into the world again and again and again every semester. Um, this takes a little bit more work. So, so you know, full disclaimer. It's also kind of fun. So again, this is an article that came up in, in a conversation among my non-scientist friends, like nobody else is teaching a &P, nobody else is a scientist. Um, and you know, we pulled up an article and tried to understand it. And that was what kind of gave me the idea of, of talking from this perspective. So if you wanna talk about something that's interesting, then you kind of think, well, what is it that we need to know about the immune system in order to understand this topic? And so this has changed so wildly in the last few years because you know, the words pandemic or epidemic or pathogen or antigen or antibody, like were not common parts of many people's vocab prior to 2020. And so now it is my practice to kind of ask the students what they already know about this. And I'll kind of, you know, as, as each student, you know, kind of contribute something, then I tend to, to kind of frame it back out to the rest of the students. So I'll say like, well, what do you guys know about vaccination? What do you know about a response to the vaccination? And I'll hear like, okay, well, what I'm hearing you guys say is that a vaccine is kind of like a dress rehearsal for the immune system, that the immune system gets to see a disabled version of the pathogen and that helps it to understand and fight better next time. And that's absolutely right. You guys have a tremendous understanding or you know, kind of whatever I would say in the classroom. And then I would go into the difference between a naive and a memory response because the students had kind of already given me that theoretically in that classroom discussion. And so we saw this, this exact graph already. I would, you know, say, well, it takes time for the immune system to kind of put together activation of different cells. But once we have activated them, then they stay primed and they're able to respond much quicker the next time. And so some, with some responses to some pathogens, we have to prime again and again and again. And with these types of pathogens, we would see vaccination requiring boosters. With other types of pathogens, we don't need to prime as often. And so we then wouldn't need as many boosters. Uh, and I would say that, that the, the kind of building up of this memory response 
is something that we would typically call immunity. And immunity doesn't mean that you're never infected and it doesn't mean that you are, like never will experience a symptom, but it means that your immune system is primed and it's going to be faster and better able to eliminate the pathogen in subsequent infections. So what is a memory response? Who is acting? What are we doing when we vaccinate? I'd say that there's really kind of three types of cells that we're thinking of when we think about memory responses. There's T cells and B cells. And of the T cells, we are kind of talking about helper and killer T cells. And I'd say the really big, um, you know, important guys in this, in this response is our helper T cells. Right? So helper T cells are these kind of squad leaders or cheerleaders, and they activate other parts of the immune system. And I would say that B cells are, are really interesting because once they're told to start making antibodies by our helper T cells, then they make antibodies. And again, antibodies is something that has become part of the, the kind of more common conversation in a community um, that wasn't there kind of uh, three years ago. So in case, you know, we aren't all at the understanding of what an antibody is, or we've heard of them, but we don't really know, then I give, and again, we talked about this amongst us, um, I would give this kind of perspective that antibodies are, are proteins that bind pathogens and help in their elimination. <clears throat> and so I was thinking that a nice way to present this topic would be to work through a case study. Case studies are great teaching tools uh, when you're topping, you know, heading through some sort of a hot topic. <coughs> excuse me, one of my immune system responses. Um, and so I thought a punctuated case study might, might kind of work in this case. And actually one of my students gave me this idea the other day. Um, so my, my student whose name truly is Angelina um, got her COVID vaccine and then was telling me that after the COVID vaccine, she had a very sore pec minor. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I had the idea of going through kind of the, the, um, anatomy, right, of this area, because uh, we would be doing a review if we were already in the immune system. So which muscle would we typically uh, uh, inject a vaccine into? And we'll let the students remember where these different muscles are. <clears throat> and then we would have our student go, uh, or our, our case study student, um, go get the vaccine a few hours later, begins to feel lethargic and achy. Here's our cue to start talking about how symptoms are really, um, you know, indicators of the immune system response. The next morning, they wake up with soreness in the axilla of the side where the vaccine was delivered. Not only is the axilla sore, but they know it's just swelling like a hard lump. And then we, I provided an image to, to indicate approximately where. And so what could we possibly, you know, use as an explanation? And usually the students will be able to get here, right? They typically do have an understanding of a lymph node being part of a response. And unlike my student who thought it was a sore pec minor, um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't provide that as an option, um, then you um, might be able to get to this um, idea that the local lymph node is, is swelling. And then we can talk about that. Well, well, what is a lymph node? And so lymph nodes are structures within the lymphatic system. They drain and house immune cells. So this is exactly what we talked about in the fundamentals. So we're just kind of using the same topics that we wanted to get at, but we're framing it out in this, in this kind of perspective of this article they found in this case study. <clears throat> it's, if you talk about vaccines in your class, I feel like it's always, always, always um, a nice opportunity to remind students that vaccines don't make you sick. They make you feel sick sometimes because again, symptoms are indicators of the immune system working, but they're not, you didn't catch the, um, the pathogen. So I usually say something along the lines of vaccines do not contain pathogens that are capable of causing infection, but they carry pieces of that pathogen or pathogens that have been disabled. So they cannot cause um, infection. And then I'll remind the students, you told me that, that the vaccine is kind of like a dress rehearsal and this is exactly why. And so when Angelina received her vaccine, cells in the skin and the muscle that are called macrophages will carry pieces of the lymph node, um, of the pathogen to the lymph node where they activate a population of cells called T cells. So our opportunity to talk about macrophages are a type of cell that are um, within the family of phagocytes. Phagocytes are cells that are able to engulf pieces or even whole pathogens, and they really tie together you know, the pathogen and the infection to the rest of the immune system that's able to respond to it. <clears throat> 
And so the two types of phagocytes that we have in our lymph nodes are macrophages and dendritic cells. And again, they're able to kind of carry these pieces to activate the other cells of the um, immune system. And so I'll say the next population that they activate is helper T cells. And you'll remember that I told you they were the squad leaders and they help to activate other pieces and components of our immune response. And so we are again, kind of getting to all the same things that we talked about in our fundamentals, but presenting it in a different way. Upper T cells drive the differentiation of B cells and antibodies are produced. <clears throat> and so then we come back to this idea of naive versus memory responses. So we um, have given the students this idea of, okay, well, we're, the pathogen or the disabled pathogen gets into the body somehow, we need to then go and activate. The activation piece really does take time, it takes energy, and it produces a set of kind of predictable symptoms. So the aches have to do with kind of changes within the bone structure as we are um, uh, having a lot of uh, hematopoietic um, uh, cell um, mitosis um, and proliferation in order to generate more of these cells. You know, the um, swollen lymph nodes is because there's all this activity going on there and that's typically gonna be near the site of the infection. This takes a tremendous amount of energy. You're making a lot more of these cells, you're making antibodies, you're activating cells. So you are depleting the energy stores of the body because these things take a lot of time. So if we're looking at this graph and we're in that kind of region of that number one with the double headed arrow, this is the time when we would see some of these very predictable responses. This time is usually one to two weeks before we have any detectable antibody. And so this is the antibody level that we're gonna see after that first response and after about two weeks of time. But then if we see the um, pathogen again, and this could be through a second vaccine, or it could be through actually encountering that pathogen uh, in its able form in the wild, we're going to have almost no time. So if you look at the difference between that kind of double-headed um, arrow with the number two versus one, it's so much faster um, because we already had activated these cells and we just need to remind them to do their job. And look, we're able to make so much more antibody this time. And the same thing is true of our T cell responses. Once we have these T cells that have gone through the process of becoming memory T cells, they are so much more able to respond quickly and do their jobs effectively. And so the more kind of memory response that we have, we have significantly less symptoms because we're not doing this work of activating. We just need all these cells to kind of proliferate and go out and do their job. And so I usually take a little bit of a moment to um, illustrate um, uh, diversity in this moment, right? If COVID has given us one thing, it is the understanding that not all our bodies are responding in exactly the same way. Um, I can't think of any other pathogen that has such a diverse effect on, on individuals. And so, um, you know, we can, we can talk about how in some immune systems, we might need a lot more time, uh, a lot more exposure. Uh, in other immune systems, we need less exposure. Um, and we can talk about some of the individual differences if you're comfortable talking about those, those factors. So if we bring us back to the original article that spurred it and spawned this conversation in our classroom, there's a, a component of biological sex in this title, right? Women report worse side effects after a COVID vaccine. And so but why, why would that be? It turns out that when we look at our, our sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, they actually have different, very different effects on the immune system. Testosterone is a mild immune system inhibitor. It really kind of dampens down immune system responses slightly, whereas estrogen is an immune system activator. It really kind of elevates the, or exacerbates uh, the responses by the immune system. And so when we think about COVID vaccines, we can imagine that in an individual with higher circulating estrogen levels, they're going to, when we, again, if we're looking at that graph, that double-headed number one, all of those things that happen in activation are a little bit more forceful, right? We're gonna see a little bit more of the activation and a little bit elevated of an immune response. Whereas if we're looking at an individual with higher levels of circulating testosterone, we're gonna see the flip side, we're going to see a depression of those activation. 
um, mechanisms. And so you might see that this individual with higher levels of testosterone isn't feeling so bad after their COVID vaccine, whereas an individual with the higher levels of estrogen is like really feeling terrible. But what might that mean for their memory responses later on? Should they encounter the pathogen again? We can kind of have that discussion in class a little bit where we talk um, through these ideas. And students, you know, most of our students have some experience with this, right? A lot of our students have been vaccinated or know people who have, and they can kind of talk through. And that really helps to kind of galvanize ideas for our students is when they, they talk through their own experiences. And then we can talk about this in, in several different ways. So this graph is from a um, study of asthma, and it's looking at the um, prevalence of asthmatic symptoms um, over time. So you can see the age is, is on the x-axis here. And so if we, we trace our biological female, where we are assuming that we might have higher levels of estrogen, uh, we can see that as they this individual <clears throat> travels through the kind of reproductive years with higher levels of circulating estrogen, remembering that estrogen is an immune system booster, then we see an exacerbation of asthma symptoms. So asthma is, an, is a kind of over eager, it's an over response of the immune system. And this helps us to indicate that when we have that encouragement of the immune system, then both are positive and negative, right? We're gonna have more strong reactions to things like vaccines, also stronger reactions to that, whatever it is that exacerbates this individual's <clears throat> asthma symptoms. And in converse, if we look at the solid line, which indicates biological males, we can assume that we're gonna see higher levels of testosterone in these individuals <clears throat> in the reproductive years. And during those kind of years, we're going to see a decrease in asthma prevalence and so because testosterone signaling doesn't kind of abruptly fall off the map the way that estrogen does, but kind of peters out over time, we actually see that in individuals with, um, with higher levels of testosterone, that asthma symptoms really are better after the onset of puberty and, and almost never go back to the same kind of level of severity that they were in childhood because testosterone signaling is kind of on board throughout the lifespan. <clears throat> So asthma is one more place where we can see these effects of sex hormones on um, the immune system. Another thing that happens is, is that of course, when we do get sick, you're going to see that um, with that slightly depressed um, immune system response, an individual with higher levels of circulating testosterone is going to respond less quickly and, and kind of um, in a moderated way. And that can allow for a pathogen to kind of have more time to replicate and really cause a more widespread infection. So, um, you know, I was a, an ardent believer in the idea that, that, you know, biological men were big whiners when they got sick until we started to uncover this research. And it turns out that for most infections, an individual with higher levels of circulating testosterone is likely to have more significant symptoms. So it's not about whining, it's actually about testosterone. Um, and one of the things that we can think of from here is the idea that we might be able to really kind of dial in the way that we run vaccination programs. So looking at the flu vaccine, it turns out that um, a biological woman, or, or if you wanna think about it as a person with higher um, circulating levels of, of estrogen can have the same response as a person uh, with higher circulating levels of testosterone with only half of the dose of the vaccine. This is a study that was done in influenza vaccines. And so we theoretically could deliver less vaccine to our individuals with higher levels of circulating estrogen and then have more vaccine to go around. or we might consider that if, depending on how the research was done, we might consider that it would be necessary to deliver twice as much vaccine to an individual with higher levels of circulating testosterone. And this is one of the times when we can really reflect on how important it is to include a diverse, you know, diversity of human subjects whenever we're doing research, because when we can start to elucidate some of these differences amongst our bodies, we could make a more tailored program for in this case vaccination, but that can always be true. And we could, I mean, it looks like theoretically we'll be taking COVID boosters for 
quite some period of time. So we could also think about this in future iterations of COVID boosters, that individuals might get different um, doses of the vaccine, depending on what um, levels of hormones they have circulating uh, in their bodies. So I wanted to pause for a second and, and see, check in with the chat, see if there were any questions or kind of points of discussion or how this feels to you guys. Like, would you not want to get into these topics in your classroom? Do you think your students would respond really well? Um, kind of uh, what, what is out there in your receptive end of this webinar? Thanks, Liz. Nothing in the Q&A here right now, but uh, let's give a few moments here while we, we see uh, the comments coming into the chat. Yeah, so I see um, about autoimmune disorders in women. So a component of autoimmune disorders that I, as far as I understand it, also has to do with prednisone's role in um, the immune system. But, but absolutely, these types of hormonal impacts on the immune system is likely the reason behind um, autoimmune disorder, um, sexual dimorphism. Yeah. And, yeah. and you'll see on the next slide, that's one of the topics that I, I think is, is a, a way to kind of hook your students. <clears throat> we did have a question come here through Q&A regarding the dose of vaccine for those with high levels of circulating estrogen. The timing during the ovarian cycle matter, for example, does it matter if the vaccine is administered during the menstrual phase or around the time of ovulation? Yeah, that is a um, fantastic question. Um, I have never seen research on that. And my guess is um, that... Um, from what I understand from, um, from, you know, people that I know that, that uh, approach clinical trials in the biotech world is that um, menstruation is often not considered. It's not asked about, it's not considered a factor. And one of the reasons is, is because if you look at the, at your data set and you're, you're, you know, the pharmaceutical company trying to present a clean story to the FDA, examining by menstru menstrual cycle <clears throat> muddies the data set. Um, right, because there's so many more factors to consider and things are all over the map. Uh, and so I, um, as I would not be surprised, I don't know for sure, but I would not be surprised if, um, if the menstrual cycle has not been considered in vaccine trials. Um, and, and certainly if you look right now, right, every adult gets the same dose of all vaccines. Right. Every child gets the same dose of, of whatever vaccine. Um, and so it, it appears to me in my uh, observations that we are really under considering these factors. And I think it could be a tremendous benefit to do more kind of consideration of menstrual cycle within clinical trials. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. <clears throat> I'm going to give like one more minute, see if anything else comes away. And then I'll talk about some other kind of ways to approach that hot topic. Question just came through. Do you have any thoughts about whether the hot topics approach would work better in smaller classes while the fundamentals work better in larger classes? I love that question because I feel I teach big classes. So my classes are between 100 and 250. Uh, and I often feel left out of really cool pedagogy stuff because I'm like, ah, I could never do that. <laughs> um, so I have done this topics approach in my large classes. And so I, I don't know, uh, you know, I think a lot of us who teach large classes use some sort of audience response, whether it's like poll everywhere or top hat or clickers. Uh, and so what you could do is pick, you know, um, three articles or three topics that you um, felt might be interesting and then let the students vote on them. Um, and so maybe you do this like a week before you get to that place in your syllabus. So you have time as the instructor to prep whichever option they choose. Um, sometimes I will open up so I use Top Hat, which has a um, discussion feature, but, but depending on whatever kind of mechanism you have for gathering student feedback, you could do a Qualtrics survey or, or even just an email uh, and say, what are the things you wonder about? Like, send to me your ideas and then pick four of those or three of those uh, and allow the students to vote. Um, but I think that um, I find that in my large classes, 
um, the students still, like, I get a little bit less of that personal, like, when I had the COVID vaccine, I felt like this, like, I don't get as much of that kind of personal um, reporting, because they're shy in those big rooms, but I do still get a ton of engagement around these topics. Um, and what ends up happening is, is that a like cluster of students comes up to the podium afterwards and then trails me to my office. Uh, and that's when I get a lot of those personal things. And we'll have usually a really lively office hours discussion amongst probably 15 or 20 students who followed me back from, from lecture. But I, um, you know, if, if the person who asked that question is a large lecture instructor, I would just um, kind of encourage you to try because I, I feel, as I, as I said, so often I feel like, oh, I don't know how that would ever play out in a large room. But I think there's actually a, a lot that we can do in large rooms. And I, I try to not let that limit me uh, when I have, um, you know, a, something I want to try or a cool idea. Um, but certainly I wouldn't ask them all to write papers because I can't ever read them all um, or even send me articles. Um, but I, I can provide them with a couple of options to get vote on. <clears throat> so my last slide um, uh, of my of the kind of stuff I prepared was um, a, a kind of laundry list of other hot topics. So I just kind of sat down at my desk and thought, well, what else could we do this with if we weren't picking a paper, right? So like an article would um, be a one great way. Um, but a lot of times students don't really understand um, the difference amongst our pathogens, so viruses and bacteria and fungi and parasites. Um, so that can be kind of a fun way to, um, to do this. And I often will start that perspective. I've given that, that option in class before. And I've talked about like, think about what an enormous job your immune system has to do. Like, think about how small a virus is that we need to like these huge microscopes in order to see them and they're inside of our cells versus like a parasite, which can be like feet in length if we're talking about like a intestinal parasite, right? Think about how hard it is for a set of cells to be able to recognize these different things. And then we'll talk a little bit about recognition um, and, and what's common among pathogens and, and maybe foreign versus um, self kind of ideas. Um, sometimes depending on your students, uh, ejection responses are really interesting. Like what is snot? Why, why do we all have that? And that happens and it's gross, right? Um, coughing, vomiting, diarrhea are all ejection responses. They're ways of clearing out, um, you know, whatever has invaded us. Ejection response as an approach is a great opportunity to do review, right? Because if we're talking about snot, we can talk about the olfactory epithelium, we can talk about mucosa, we can talk about um, mucus glands. If we're talking about um, coughing, we can talk about the muscles involved in that and the accessory muscles of respiration. Uh, if we're talking about vomiting, we can talk about kind of that um, parts of the um, GI tract, and, and then we can talk about the ab muscles, which are actually the drivers of vomiting. If we're talking about diarrhea, we can talk about peristalsis, right? So that's kind of a nice way of using the immune system is actually a giant A&P review. Um, <clears throat> so when um, brought into the, the um, chat, the idea of autoimmune diseases and autoimmune disease therapeutics. And so these are both depending, especially depending on kind of your student population, these can be really interesting topics and ways of thinking about um, dysregulation of the immune system. What happens when our immune system recognizes something about ourselves? Um, Again, for the past couple of years, vaccines, antigens, and antibodies have been really popular. It also, the, that conversation around these topics has changed wildly. Like, as I said, you know, four years ago, my classes really didn't know what an antigen was. That was a brand new word for them. And now they take those antigen tests, you know, a couple times a year, probably. So they have like a little bit more of an understanding, or at least they're familiar with the word. And then we can talk about what that's about. Uh, and then allergies are usually popular, right? So if you teach traditionally aged students, this demographic, this kind of 18 to 25 year olds um, are amongst that group where we see, we saw kind of um, this huge increase in um, the prevalence of allergies. Uh, and so we can talk about the difference in allergic responses, why some people have to carry an EpiPen and some people just have to carry tissues in May, but we both have allergies. Uh, we can talk about um, how um, practices by the American Association of Pediatrics to avoid certain foods led to a huge increase in food allergies for a short period of time, you know, and that gets us to the idea of tolerance and surveillance. Um, so there's kind of a lot of different places you can take that allergy conversation, but students typically respond to this because if they don't personally have allergies, they are definitely in a minority. Um, and so there's usually a lot of kind of rich discussion items that, that are possible there. 
So again, I'm just going to pause real quick and see if there's any other questions or discussion points uh, that people want to bring up. I am not seeing anything come through. However, Liz, in the meantime, if we're waiting for folks to uh, potentially put some things into the Q&A, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll just talk real quick about our HAPS Partners to Engage page. So again, thank you, Liz. Uh, so we'll be posting this recording to the session and all the sessions of the series on our HAPS Partners to Engage page. I'm going to put this link into the Zoom chat for you all to bookmark if you wish. So just give me one second here. All right, so I popped that in there so you all can bookmark if you wish. And um, there's also uh, the recordings are found as well on the um, page I had put before in chat. Uh, let me see if I can find that again as well for you. But uh, we'll just wait here for a few more moments to see if any other questions uh, do come in. But uh, we do want to thank everyone for uh, attending today's uh, webinar. And if you had a chance to see all the webinar series or, or the, the webinar series in its entirety, uh, we appreciate your, your thoughts and opinions. Um, we have a survey that once you exit out, you'll be given an opportunity to answer. So if you could take a few moments to answer the survey, uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback. This is how we know how to get better for future events such as this. So um, we'll stay on the line here for a little bit to see if any other questions come in. But thank you again, everyone.